Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship at St. John's Lutheran Church. We'll again follow the order of service as printed in the service folder. I invite you to stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his one and only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord, for the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ For the well-being of your holy church in all the world and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, Uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name on all the earth. Almighty God, merciful Father, you crown our life with your love. You take away our sins. Let us pray. O God, protector of all the faithful, you alone make strong, you alone make holy. Show us your mercy and forgive our sins day by day. Guide us through our earthly lives that we do not lose the things you have prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The lessons for this fourth Sunday after Pentecost are printed in the service folder. You may read along if you would like. The Holy God approaches us through human messengers who speak a message of hope so that people may not fear but have faith in him as the God of grace and salvation. A reading from the book of Exodus Chapter 19, after they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. This is the word of the Lord. We join together now in the Psalm of the day, reading responsibly. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. Our Lord Jesus fulfilled the promise to give us complete reconciliation with God and certain hope for heaven by his own death and resurrection, because of which we now live as his spirit-filled, faithful people. A reading from the letter to the Romans, chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. We now join together in reading the verse of the day. Alleluia. May your peace be full with righteousness. May your saints sing for joy. Alleluia. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord. Our Savior's compassion also compels you and me to serve for the eternal salvation of others, those who are not citizens of God's kingdom yet, by praying to God and proclaiming his gospel. I invite you to stand for the reading of his gospel. The gospel according to Matthew, chapters 9 and 10. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, On this communion Sunday, we now join together in confessing the Nicene Creed. We profess together. We
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The punchline, the climax, the milestone. Whether we're talking about a joke or a story or a person's life, there's always a defining moment. A moment in the joke that makes it memorable for days to come and enjoyable to retell. A moment in the story that introduces a significant turning point that closes one chapter and opens another to a new direction and resolution. A moment in a person's life that defines who that person is and helps others relate to that person afterwards. Much in the same way, a man by the name of Saul became the apostle known as Paul in one defining moment in his life. You may remember from Acts chapter 9, Saul dedicated body and soul to the destruction of the way. From his unbelieving viewpoint, this new religious sect branching off of traditional Judaism, a ragtag group of people who dared to claim that the Christ of God had come into this person named Jesus, who died on a cross outside Jerusalem's walls. And as Saul marched his way toward Damascus one day, with murderous intentions and plans, this living, the risen and ascended Christ, confronted him on the road. Saul was struck by a blinding light from heaven and knocked to the ground with the guilt of what he had been proud of. He persecuted and supervised the killing of followers of this Jesus, who had now revealed to Saul he was the one true Lord, whom Saul had thought that he had been worshiping wholeheartedly and serving faithfully his entire life, the Lord. Yet there was grace for a man, for a person like Saul, and water to wash away all his guilt. And so began his journey, his milestone as a believer to gladly tell the whole world about the forgiveness he found in the blood of Jesus. And his personal experience, Paul would, would share with anyone. He testified before kings in their palaces, encouraged fellow Christians in his letters, which is almost half the New Testament. With anyone he met, came into contact with, he gladly shared everlasting hope in this Jesus. From that day, Paul was never Saul again. Now, fellow believers, your background as well as mine and our experiences may not relate all that much to the Apostle Paul's, but the grace of God revealed in the same Jesus as his son has had the same effect. You and I, think of the baptism you received. Think of all the opportunities to hear and read the Bible, God's very word. Once again, to receive his sacrament today. All those opportunities, evidences of God's grace throughout our lifetime. And it's been about much more than gaining book knowledge to recite facts and verses from the Bible by memory, by rote. It's been about much more than just repeatedly going through a series of rites and rituals on Sunday morning. This has always been about your life, your personal relationship with God, and your daily living for God. Today is another defining moment for you and me as believers in Christ because we're reminded once again who we are in him. A child of God, a follower of Christ. And to be able to, to rejoice in that grace and, and to live by that truth all our days, you need to be able to see yourself in your Savior. This service, again, Today's worship, as always, is about your everlasting identity as a believer in Christ. Because identity matters. It is really important. 
because it affects the way you view yourself, your interactions with others, and even such things as your choices of friends and jobs. But when we're talking about our spiritual identity as believers in Christ, this becomes all the more vital for several reasons. For one thing, you and I cannot come up with, we cannot create this identity on our own or then suddenly change it at a whim to fit in with the crowd because it is a costly gift from God paid at the expense of his own son that he alone can give. And it is at the very heart of our faith as believers, our love for and our trust in God above everyone and anything else. In addition to that, this identity in Christ, it lasts not only during our lifetime on this earth, but more significantly, forevermore in heaven into eternity. Think of it this way. You and I will possibly have fulfilled a number and variety of roles during our lives in this world. It starts out with being a child. Then, church member, like through baptism, student, worker, good friend, spouse, parent, yeah, the list can continue, but only one will remain forevermore. Child of God, brother or sister in Christ. That's how all believers will relate to the Lord and to one another without end. But again, don't forget about how identity influences behavior. I mean, most of the time, we will speak and act a certain way precisely because of the place we're at and the people we're with, and that's not a problem. Uh, for example, you might talk to close friends during a lunch in the week than you necessarily do with, differently with fellow members at church after service today. That's not necessarily a problem, unless, of course, there's a hypocritical attitude lurking in our hearts and minds, as if to say, I'll be and can be one person at church, but then I could be someone else entirely different the rest of the week in order to fit how I want to be seen or be known or to play the part I'm expected instead of wanting what the Lord has saved us to be and do. Of course, that kind of thinking quickly becomes disloyalty to the Lord and a denial of our identity and relationship with him and with each other as fellow believers. But every time, that's where the problem begins for you and me. One way or another, we deny who we are as Christians. Now, as you know, as well as I do, I could warn you any Sunday, like today, I could warn you about any number of sins that are prone to our ages or prone in our society at this time and how they ruin our identity. They harm our relationship with God and with one another, this fellowship that's supposed to last for eternity. But you and I could still take sin way too lightly or develop some false sense of security about ourselves if we forget how God defines sin. Sin, according to God, is simply any way in our hearts or in our lives that we try to assert independence from God as our Savior and Lord. Sin is any way in which we don't see or match our identity to God, to his will and ways, but instead trust in ourselves more or prefer to take our own path. By the way, that's why the punishment for sin is so severe, because sin always directly reflects back onto God. But that's a far cry from the petition we pray every Sunday, if not more often. Hallowed be thy name. The tragedy is, the real truth, is sin also is part of our identity as people, much more than we realize or much more than we're ashamed of. 
But God does not want you or me to live under that shame or fear. I mean, no relationship can survive, let alone bring two persons closer together under those kind of conditions, under that kind of doublespeak and hypocrisy. And that's true for even relationships in this world, coworkers, friends, spouses. How much more so in a relationship between us and our holy God? What a relief it is, right? To hear Paul's words to the Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Certain words immediately jump out at you, don't they? Justified, faith, peace, grace, hope, glory. Those words are more than biblical jargon. They're packed with meaning for us in our lives. I mean, in an ingenious way, the apostle used these words to write out a timeline of our spiritual life and experiences by which the Lord brings us to himself, which will reach their greatest fulfillment at the resurrection of the dead on the last day. The glory, pure and everlasting, but we wouldn't be able to grasp their meaning. We won't even know how these words apply to our lives here and now, unless we notice something else first that binds all these, me these words, their, their meaning together through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, God's saving plan clicks in our minds, right? You and I begin to see again God's wisdom in carefully carrying out his will, his saving will, his plan of salvation throughout this world's existence ever since the fall into sin. We can also appreciate his love that has kept his saving promises alive and intact despite so many sinful people and evil angels always trying to thwart his saving intentions and works. You and I can marvel at the mercy that God has shown us by bringing this gracious message to us in our days, into our hearts, that God has actually reconciled us to himself. That God has reclaimed you and me to be his people again, dearly loved children, by sending his only eternally begotten son to identify with us. That's the message, the miracle of the gospel and of our faith. God the Son was born, Jesus, the son of man, as he often called himself, the son of Mary. What does that mean? His life reminds us the righteousness and relationship that everyone has lost, how desperately we need him as savior because of our sin. But it reminds us above all that Jesus came to deliver and to reclaim us as people of God because he took our identity, our sinful identity upon himself to a cross and he gave us his holy identity, his righteousness instead as a pure gift of his love and mercy. And then he died. And our sinfulness, that part of us died with him and was buried in his tomb. And so God no longer looks at us as enemies, but as his people, as his children forevermore, never again as enemies. Because Jesus' tomb, three days later, was found to be empty. No trace of sin, no hint of death, only resurrection, life and love everlasting. Only redemption, full and free, for you and for me. And you and I know that is the reality for us even now. Because in this gospel, God enables us to see ourselves in our Savior. And God, more than that, he has bound us to himself in a way 
By blood relation, you and I receive his body and blood, again this morning in the sacrament, that identifies us with his holy son, so that when God sees you and me, he's also really seeing Jesus. I mean, <laughs> how fantastic. That is pure grace and peace for us. And to keep that relationship strong, to keep our faith in him dedicated, God also has bind us to himself in a way like no other. It's by what he gives you and me. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. God is truly with us in a way that he's nowhere else in the universe. The Lord is with us, <laughs> inside and out. Fellow believers, the true challenge for us then is this. Regardless of your age and or experiences, stay committed. Stay devoted to the truth that God has revealed. Stay hopeful in his grace and in his gospel as the Lord, your Savior, and God. I mean, I understand, though, how impossible that sounds. How <laughs> ludicrous, right? Given our track record that we prove every day. How can I say that? Stay committed, stay devoted, in, all, in any seriousness. Because it's his promise. In fact, it was the Lord's prayer before he died for the world. I pray also, Father, for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. What seem, seems impossible for us is certainly not for the Lord our God. And he makes it happen every day, in our hearts, in our lives. Because you'll notice again, such promises as out of this world as they sound and are, such promises are true because the one who stands behind them is faithful. Like Paul would later write, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And whose strength? His strength. The Lord makes each day, frankly, fellow believers, he makes each day of our lives a defining moment for us as believers because he leads us to dedicate ourselves to him. He enables us to declare his praise before the world, before family and friends, because he blesses us with the ability to see, to see ourselves, for you to see yourself in your Savior. Amen. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I now invite you to stand as we continue with prayer. And among our petitions this morning, we also include Doug Carroll and Ray Bank, who have recently entered hospice care. We pray. Lord and Savior, you have purchased us to be your own for all eternity. You have given purpose to our time in this life by making us your witnesses to lost sinners. We thank you for the high privilege of working with you to gather your elect into your kingdom. As you looked with compassion on the lost sheep of Israel, grant that your Holy Spirit may move us to look with compassion on the lost of our day. Fill us then with zeal to do all that we can to bring them the precious gospel so that they too may experience the joy of being your people and disciples. Enable us to be faithful witnesses to all whose lives we touch, whether it be in the privacy of our homes or in our communities. Look with compassion on all people, especially those who are suffering. Give help and relief to all who are in need. Give them patience and thankfulness in their pain, and anxiety for the lost, and move us to have compassion on them, and help them according to their needs, as a witness to your love. 
Lord Jesus, it is at those times when we're helpless in the face of illness or tragedy that we again realize our desperate need for your eternal love and almighty care and are led to rely fully on you for all things. And so we turn to you on behalf of your servants, Doug and Ray, as well as pray for their concerned family, families and friends. Assure them all that Doug and Ray remain the objects of your grace and mercy and bless the medical means being used to treat their bodies and bring relief and healing according to your will and wisdom. Although we have failed you again and again, we have learned to know you as a merciful and patient God. We ask you, therefore, to forgive, for the, forgive us for the many times we have failed to share the message of your love in your Son with those who need it most. Renew us, Lord, restore us, and use us to proclaim your love by word and deed to all people near and far. May many more rejoice with us and we with them when together we stand before your throne of glory. We confidently ask these things in your holy name. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give praise. praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in love. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. His Son has called us to be His own so that we may live under Him in His kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. O oh, At this time, the ushers will distribute the elements, the wafer and wine, to the congregation. And once those are distributed to everyone, we will continue with the words of reception.
We now continue with the words of reception, beginning with the wafer. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. And take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sin. The true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. We now continue the service by thanking the Lord, and I invite you to stand. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Again, a joy to worship the Lord with you this morning and to be reminded of our everlasting identity in our Savior Jesus that we are children of God, even now, together in Christ. Uh, really, I have not many announcements to highlight. Uh, there are some in the service folder. Uh, take a look over those at your convenience. But I just would like to invite everyone. Uh, we'll have 19-minute Bible study, uh, whether in the fellowship hall or back in the church. Um, but we'll have that shortly. See, it's almost quarter till. Maybe about 10 so minutes. Uh, but otherwise, I wish you blessings to your day and week ahead. Thank you.